This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. Thank you for tuning in over the past few episodes. As always, it is appreciated and I hope you've got something from them. There was the Iran preview. There was the women's very first game. I found that one really interesting one. That was great to go up there. If you haven't heard it, Go tune in, find out your podcast provider of choice or threelionspodcast.com. And of course, if you have just found the podcast, welcome along to you if you are new. Coming up on this episode, I will be chatting with Aidan Smith from threelions.net and also to Gaurav Singhvi to get an American perspective ahead of our game with them on Friday the 25th. Okay. It's up and running, the 2022 Qatar World Cup. The opening ceremony happened. Morgan Freeman. That was a surprise, I have to say. I didn't see that coming. I uh, listened to the opening game between Qatar and Ecuador in the car whilst stuck in M25 traffic uh, and caught the brief highlights later that evening. Would appear I didn't miss much. VAR, as I predicted had its say almost immediately, and it's said a few more things since. Infantino has said some silly things of late, but that press conference took the biscuit, laughable, and reiterates pretty much everything we already know about FIFA. Hey, if you've not seen the Netflix series called FIFA Uncovered, go and find it. Try and squeeze it in amongst all these games that are taking place at the moment. Four games a day. Yeah, try and squeeze in FIFA Uncovered. I don't know, either at half past eight in the morning or 10 o'clock in the evening. It might have to be gone 10 o'clock with all this injury time. So that was the first game. Then it was on to the second game of the tournament and our turn on the big stage. I don't think we've ever been second on the bill in before have we but we'll come to that very soon but some quick observations on from what i have seen so far doesn't it get dark quickly over there the iran game okay 14 minutes injury time in that first half fair enough justified it was played in bright sunshine and by the time they came back to the second half they were playing with shadows it was like someone had flicked the light switch. Uh, injury time, as I've just mentioned, uh, it would appear to be a new FIFA directive, supposedly to counteract time wasting. That England Iran game, 14 minutes in the first half, justified for the Iranian keeper's injury. Then 10 in the second half, 10 minutes uh, in Senegal, Netherlands, which the Dutch profited from and scored. 10 at the end of Wales, USA. There has just been, at the time of recording this, I've just finished watching Saudi Arabia, Argentina, which I'll get on to in a minute. There was a good 10 minutes at the end of that. Now, I know there's a lot more substitutions now, what with expanded squads, but the times added are crazy. Personally, I think it's now time for a rugby-style clock, you know, where it is stopped where as and when there is a a break in play because personally I'm not keen on seeing games go into the 100 minute mark and beyond VAR as I said I knew this would crop up Ecuador had that one dismissed in the very first game Argentina had three chalked off against Saudi Arabia let's get on to that who saw that performance and result coming if you had a couple of quid on that fair play Uh, Fair play to the Saudis as well. Amazing. Although for those that remember, 1990, Argentina, they lost that opening game to Cameroon and still went on to make the final. 
But this has certainly been one of the World Cup upsets of all time. Up there with 1950 USA England, 66 North Korea beating Italy, 82 Algeria beating West Germany, 1990 Costa Rica beating Scotland, Uh, 2002 there was Senegal beating France and South Korea beating Italy. Uh, And South Korea again 2018 when they beat Germany. But this one, Saudi Arabia beating Argentina by two goals to one. Coming from behind to win two goals to one. Bravo. Well done. Uh, Another observation. Uh, Now this is a tricky one for the fact that I'm not out in Qatar. So not got first-hand experience. But watching the games and seeing empty seats is disappointing and also hearing of ticketing issues where people are struggling to get into the grounds on time i know it's been well advised to get there within two hours to spare but with apps crashing it's not good to hear i'm hoping that these issues will be ironed out soon Then there was the alcohol scenario where FIFA announced on the eve of the tournament that alcohol wouldn't be sold within the stadium perimeters. Again, I'm not there. and I'm not the biggest drinker, I have to say. But I feel it's more the last minute, the late notice of the changes. And when apparently stadium beers were quoted as being in the region of £11.50, 12 quid, it would never have been something that I would have had many of. But as I say, just that late notice of it all. And who would have thought that the other major talking point would be about a captain's armband? Again, another last-minute U-turn. FIFA ordered the nations who were planning on wearing a one-love-inclusive captain's armband that they would be penalised for doing so. And after all the positive talk that the FA had spoken about, they backed down. Along with Wales, Denmark, Germany, France, Belgium, Switzerland, the Netherlands, the FA said that they were prepared to pay a fine but wouldn't allow the scenario where Harry Kane could potentially be booked before a ball had even been kicked. I thought actually Roy Keane made a great point where he said that they could have worn it in the first game, taken the booking, taken the hit, Showing you're standing up for what you believe in. Obviously not the way the FA were thinking though. I've said it before, football and politics shouldn't mix. It's never going to happen though, is it? There is no way around it, frankly. Football needs to talk more. It can't just be a FIFA closed shop. Now, enough of me jabbering on. Let's bring in Aidan Smith from 3lions.net. Aidan, hello there. Hi, Russell. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good to speak to you again. Good to see you again. It's been a while. It has been. But, um, are you keeping well? Absolutely, yeah. Certainly after that result. It is. Yeah, well, what, we're speaking immediately after the, uh, after the Argentina game here. So a couple of results, as it might be. Yeah, exactly. Well, we needed a shock early on in that tournament. Exactly. Yeah. Well, as as we we're just saying, thankfully it wasn't us. Um, yeah. Let Let's talk Iran. I don't know how you personally felt going into the game, but I thought Iran would have been a tougher opposition than they ultimately turned out to be. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would absolutely agree with that. Iran are a team who typically are very, very difficult to play against especially with their manager, Carlos Quiros, mm. um, who I believe was manager in 2018 at the last, last World Cup as well. Iran are a team who sit in very deep. They don't tend to press very high. And what that means is there's no space in behind. You have to make the space yourself, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. And they're fine with surrendering possession, uh, like we saw yesterday. But yeah, to be honest with you, it was it was very impressive how we were able to sort of manoeuvre their players and disrupt their defensive shape almost seamlessly at times. Do you think that losing their goalkeeper played a factor into the whole game as a whole? Because he, he's a quite a, a decent keeper by all accounts. And, and it took, I can't remember how long he was 
the the incident went on for, but obviously they added 14 minutes on at the end of the, that first half. So you're looking at a good 10 minutes of time there. It just just sort of like struck a hole in the game and everyone had to regroup. And we clearly regrouped better and, and got on the uh, on the front foot quicker. Yeah, he's a good goalkeeper. No disrespect to their second choice who came on and I, I thought, you know, actually came in into a really hard game, actually, yeah. um, and and gave a good account of himself um, for most of it. I don't think he was really at fault for many of the goals. This is pretty much exactly what happened. I don't know if you remember, but four years ago in our opening game against Tunisia, where their goalkeeper, um, for similar reasons, went down early on and had to come off. They had to get replaced. And it's just not what you want, especially against a, you know, a team like England. And, and a position like the goalkeeper, you want to know who's behind you in goal and, yeah. and know that, you know, you trust them with your life going into an opening game of a tournament. And that kind of disruption, you know, to the to the team system is not one which you'd wish on any team, really. Yeah. No, I, I must admit, I'd forgotten about that, the Tunisia incident. Um, the game there that we ultimately won 2-1 in the, uh, in the last minute, that one. Now, I know you're a man of preference to formations and tactics and and that sort of thing England as or England supporters as we are I think generally thought going into the game we'd be playing with a back five ultimately it it turned out to be a 4-3-3 four four at the back of Shaw, Stones, Maguire and Trippier was was that something that surprised you? I wouldn't say it surprised me what what did surprise me was the fact that um, in the build-up to the game a lot of the talk was about how Southgate has favoured the three four three, you know, over a four three three, you know, over over his whole tenure. Um, that surprised me because actually, when you look back at the games where he's used the three four three, it's been at very specific times when there's a tactical issue that you can't solve with four at the back. I think the four the four at the back has been the the preference, and certainly for a game like this against Iran. That's going. That was always going to be the way we were going to win this game. Um, without getting too technical, it's it's to do with the you know the the movement that you're able to create, and also the the three men in midfield as opposed to two men helps you uh, control the game far better. Yeah, well, uh, the three in midfield, obviously Bellingham, Rice, and Mount, uh, is such a uh, an attacking lineup um, with the three in front of them starting Saka, Kane, and Sterling. It all, as I say, the the goalkeeper was out of action and and was eventually changed. And it was then that Harry Maguire hit the bar and that was then really, we we began to kick in because then two minutes later, three minutes later, Jude Bellingham got not only his first England goal, but England's first World Cup goal of this tournament through a, uh, just a lot of the goals came from crosses, didn't they, into the middle. Yeah, he said he'd been saving that goal. So I'm really pleased for him. What I'm most pleased about, actually, is the fact that, you know, we've got this player who everyone's been talking about. Everyone wants him to start. And, we've, you know, we've always got that, that player or a couple of those players going into every tournament. This one felt a little bit different because there's an argument that this guy's going to be world class. Unless he, you know, let, let's suppose he going into this tournament, we don't know, but we're, we're, we're expecting he's going to play start most of the games if he doesn't perform in this tournament you start asking questions about well is he the player we thought he is maybe he is but he's just not going to turn it on for international level which we've seen before with England players we've certainly seen that before and you know there was there was talk like that with um, with Harry Kane four years ago after his Euro disaster uh, you know along with the whole squad having not scored at 2016 if if he doesn't score against Tunisia in that opening game, you start asking questions about, well, you know, does he have a problem with to- scoring in tournament football? And the same was, was you know, on my mind with Jude Bellingham, not necessarily about scoring, but just is he going to be able to control the game like everyone wants him to? Are we going to use him in the right way? Um, the 3-4-3 three, three doesn't so much pander to his um, specialities as much. Um, there's more of a, you know, a, a need for those two central midfielders to to almost protect the back line. But in a, in a four, three, three, he was more able to express himself. And I'm, I'm really pleased that we've got those young players now who are beginning to perform. And 
overall it felt like a miles milestone day for, for for many different reasons and you know one of which is is the fact that we've got these young players now scoring goals getting in on the act for the last two tournaments under Gareth Southgate as good as they've been we've been very reliant on Harry Kane and Raheem Sterling for goals in fact 15 of the 23 that we've scored at major tournaments under Southgate before this game have been scored by Kane, Sterling or Harry Maguire. Right. And of the remaining eight, four of them were defenders. One of, one of them an own goal and one of them Jordan Henderson from a corner. So really our, our young attacking players haven't been getting on the end of the chances. They've been creating the chances a lot. And, you know, they've been in build up and, and in both of the tournaments that we've had so far, they've been very heavily involved and given great account of themselves, but we're now starting to get them on the end of the chances. And that's something that we've struggled with over the last year, as well as in the last two tournaments. We've now got a situation whereby the players are able to, are able to score. You know, we've almost broken that duck early doors now. And not just with Bellingham, Saka, Rashford, Grealish. That's Rashford's first tournament goal for England. And it seems like he's been playing for, for years now. Yes. And it only took him three touches, didn't it? He touches 49 seconds, wow, 49 yeah. seconds on the pitch. Incredible. And now we've got four of our five wingers in this squad have already scored after the first game. And that is invaluable at this point in time. Yeah. Now, every one of those scorers, Bellingham, Saka with his couple, Sterling, Rashford, Grealish, each one of those had never scored at a World Cup before. I mean, granted, obviously, Saka and... Grealish Bellingham had never played at a World Cup before, um, but it's such a, uh, as you say, such a great thing for them just to get that in that first game. It's such a confidence booster, not just for them, but for the for the whole team as well. And Saka, so, both of his goals, I thought, were, were expertly taken. Yeah, absolutely. And like you were just saying there, uh, you know, I, I did just say it before, I think it, it was a milestone day for lots of reasons. You know, if we think about opening games you know they've not been brilliant for England over the no. years we started to we started to change that in recent years and this one was just you know we went out hell for leather and it was it was more of what we've expected under Southgate and I think it's easy to take it for granted but actually you know our last opening game victory by more than a goal in a major tournament was 1998 you know uh, at the World Cup and you know it's another opening game win for us multiple goals like I just said um, and we got two up in the first half I think that's something that we've struggled with under Southgate is in big games you know are we able to get that second goal after we go ahead to really you know stamp our authority on the game a substitute goal for the first time in a major tournament under Gareth Southgate right two, yeah. yep Rashford and Grealish we've not mm. done that under Gareth Southgate at all it's always been starters who have who've you know put the ball in the back of the net at the end of an attack and also the possession stats. I mean, you'll know just as well as I as I do, 78%. And um, I was doing a bit of poking around. That's actually the second highest uh, number of passes, 716 passes of any team in a World Cup since 1966. Was it really? Wow. <laughs> omens, omens. <laughs> mm, exactly. But what's really refreshing is the fact that, you know, we, we knew we were going to have more of the ball. That was yes. always going to be the case, the way that Iran set up. But we were able to create the opportunities as well. And, it, you know, it wasn't idle. There's a, you know, it's very easy for a game like that to go very stale very quickly. But it wasn't. And, you know, it was, it was zestful. It was, you know, it was fresh. It was forward thinking. And that, that for me, was the key. Yeah. Well, don't, I'd hate to be the one to, to bring us back down to earth, but they had chances or they had, they had effectively three chances. They scored from one. They were given a penalty as another and Pickford pulled off a, a very good save. Now, from, from memory, they were their three main chances. Should we be concerned that, I don't know whether America could pick us apart a bit more, Wales maybe, and then going forward, a better team could pick us apart a lot more than Iran did? Yes, I think there's, there's a case for, for, for that possibly should be concerned but I think you've also got to look at the nuance of this game in particular you know what did we have to do that meant that you know we, we left ourselves exposed they play a 5-4-1 in you know in defense and that is that is the deepest formation you can play yeah. counting your own box pretty much we had to commit a lot of players to every attack to cause overloads 
we would, you know, decoy runs, all of that sort of thing, rotations all over the pitch. And at that point, it means that the usual sort of block of five that you might have behind the attack, we had we had four basically because we had to commit six players to the to the final stage of an attack instead of five to overload their back five. Yeah. And it meant that we just had Declan Rice, the two centre backs, and one of the full backs. And that won't be the case against the USA. So we're going to have an extra man there for security. But I also think, yes, of course, we, we've spoken for a long time about how England's defence is probably the, the weak point. You know, we, we were talking a lot about this in the lead up to Euro 2021. And what we did, in fact, was made sure that what we weren't doing was conceding goals at all. And we thought, OK, you know, we'll, we'll snatch a goal at some point in, in, in each game. But actually, we were very reserved and it was a collective objective to keep that clean sheet. Yesterday was a very different sort of game. You know, we, we knew that the emphasis was going to be how are we going to create enough chances to be able to stick the ball in the back of the net on one of them. Because against the team who play the way Iran do, the chances really will be half chances. They're not going to be great quality chances. So you need to create enough to be able to give yourself the best chance of scoring. And there was a lot of talk in the lead up to this game about how we, we're going to have to be patient. We're not going to be able to create many chances. You know, it's going to be it's going to be a horrible game to play in sort of thing. But I didn't see any of that. I didn't see any of that at all. But going back to what you were just saying there about the defence, I think, yeah, let's let's see. I was I was just saying to a few people after the game yesterday that I'd be more than happy with a couple of one nils now to get us through the group, just yeah. to get those clean sheets in early doors. Um, but let's 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 see what happens. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a great way to start. As as I always said, you win your first game in a uh, in a World Cup or in a tournament. It sets you up, sets you up for the. The, the tournament to come and, and in the group. And I think, to be honest, as the way this group falls, I can see us beating America. And we are quite fortunate in the fact that we have Wales last, that hopefully we can have six points in the bag. And then as the uh, the cliched local derby comes up where form goes out the window, we can see how that game will, will unfold. Yeah, I was very pleased. But given that we had Wales in the group, uh, you know, when, when the draw was made, I was very pleased that it was the third game because I think what's going to be key in that game is, you know, we're going to have to play as though it's a World Cup game like any other. And Wales are going to want to play as though it's a local derby because that's going to suit them. You know, th- you know, th- there's no pressure on them at the moment as much as, you know, th- the more they can make it about an occasion instead of just a football match the better for them. So we're going to have to strip it back and, and go back to basics and say, okay, you look, we're a better footballing side than Wales. Let's keep it to that. Let's make sure we don't get caught up in the in the noise. The USA game is going to be crucial for that because I think if we if we go into that final game already through, that sends a big message to Wales. And they're going to have to approach that game a little bit differently. Yeah, it's a, it's it's one to look forward to for sure. Absolutely. Well we will look forward to that. Just on the the World Cup as it is, we're as I say, we're speaking just shortly after the um, the Argentina Saudi Arabia game. What what have been your thoughts on what you've seen just so far? Uh, wasn't impressed by the Dutch at all. I don't think they managed to stamp you know their their, their mark on the tournament at all. It looked as though they were going to snatch the win towards the end, but not not deservedly. Argentina, I had tipped to be favourites to win the win the tournament possibly um, take, you know, a little bit reserved in that, given that their midfield isn't the typical midfield that wins a tournament. Um, perhaps they can't control games in the same way that, you know, Germany 2014 or, you know, other teams that we've seen. But I do think that they are incredibly dangerous. And I, I've been very surprised at what I've seen this morning. Um, at the time of recording this, obviously, the game is this morning. So, you know, fair play to Saudi Arabia. I think they were absolutely fantastic. There was a lot of talk about their high line um, mm, but and were, wasn't it? Yeah, goodness me, it was. Yeah, but um, the bravery paid off. Absolutely, they were yeah. they were absolutely fantastic for ninety minutes. Yeah. Well, we'll wait to see what the uh, the other usual sp- suspects do. Your Germany's, your Brazil's, your France. Um, we shall see going forward. Aidan, thank you as always for uh, for joining us. Hopefully, uh, the further we go into the tournament, we can uh, we can carry on speaking. Thanks very much, Russell. I'd love to.
Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the Three Lions podcast, Gaurav Singhvi, uh, who, well, we're killing two birds with one stone on this episode because it's uh, from the States, but he's also in Qatar. Gaurav, hello there. Hey, Russell, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good to speak again. You as well. I've uh, really enjoyed uh, the podcast, the last several episodes, your World Cup recaps and uh, um, a lot of the other ones. So it's a pleasure to speak to you. That's very kind of you to say. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, so you've flown over to Qatar. Uh, How long's the flight from the States to Qatar? And remind us whereabouts you are back home. So I'm in uh, LA and California, and um, my trip here was a little circuitous. Um, I've actually planned the the week in uh, Qatar with um, kind of a holiday in the UAE, and then also a visit to India um, to see family. Okay. Just because... um, it's quite a distance from uh, uh, California to here. So, and I have some family in India, so I thought it'd be a good way to uh, knock out both things since it's kind of a short hop from here to, uh, to India. But the flight to UAE was long. It was uh, a 16 hour flight to Dubai and the uh, time difference is 12 hours. So it's, it's, it's a very kind of tricky um, jet lag to get over. So I um, I flew into uh, Dubai on uh, uh, I left Saturday afternoon and I got in Sunday evening and then um, Monday afternoon I flew into Qatar that was about a forty five minute flight from uh, uh, from the UAE to Qatar to Doha um, and I think a lot of people um, I don't want to say they had my idea but there was a lot of people who were seemed to be transiting back and forth. Uh, between the two uh, nations, um, whether they're doing it on a daily basis or they were just able to fly into the UAE. And then that was kind of an easier launching point for them to uh, get into Doha. Yeah. No, I've, I've got the impression there are some like shuttle flights going between the two, um, which right. are, a few fans are, are obviously deciding to uh, to use. They've obviously got a uh, some surplus cash to be able to do that a few times, I would imagine. <laughs> Although, uh, you're right, but although based on... Um, the housing uh, prices, uh, it's, it might be, you know, might kind of balance out. Uh, um, and that was kind of another tricky thing. I, I planned this trip um, all the way back in April. And um, it was, I decided to just kind of finalize everything in April. And it was because um, I wasn't sure whether there would be more supply would um, come online or whether the prices would go up or down. So looking back on it, I think I might have jumped the gun a little earlier. Um, I might have had some better options if I had waited a little bit longer, but it's kind of always hard to uh, predict these things. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, you, you've touched down in Qatar there. What, what's your immediate impressions of the place? What's it like there? Yeah, so it's uh, it's uh, it's it's quite different. Um, I think uh, it definitely seems like um, it's kind of a how do I put this? It's it's kind of too small of a place uh, to be hosting. Uh, a tournament this size it just seems uh, very crowded um i'm not even commenting on kind of the uh, the merits of qatar holding it or mm-hmm. you know the various various controversies um uh too i'm just kind of commenting on just the size and just how crowded it it feels uh but that being said it seems like they've put a lot of work and effort into it and it seems um as well organized um as it can be when you're trying to cram uh, this many people into basically uh, a, a city um i don't i don't even think it's a very large city and then some kind of small suburbs around it so um so i think um i guess overall my impression is kind of mixed um i do have to say i'm kind of more impressed than i thought i would be with my accommodations um i booked an apartment um kind of near the airport and um it looks like it's a new construction but it seems like it's been constructed pretty well and the furnishings are quite nice i see I mean, there's been some stories back here in England saying that some of the accommodation um, there, well, we knew that there were going to be tents in the desert um, and a lot has been made of that. Um, but you seem to have seem to have done all right there from what I can see. But just feel free to comment on, on what you want and what you don't want. But what, what's been the perception from America about Qatar and, and its opening ceremony and, and so forth? I, I think uh, I don't think the Americans. I don't think we've taken um, kind of as uh, uh, hard a view. I guess is a good way to put it as um, as some of the uh, English folks and some of the Europeans in general, mm. in terms of uh, 
you know, commenting on whether um, Qatar should be hosting this tournament for the whole host of reasons uh, outlined, um, you know, whether it's uh, the human rights issue or uh, just kind of the bidding process or what happened to the workers um, or maybe some of the uh, question marks surrounding the bid. Um, I haven't, cause I do follow, um, you know, I do follow English football uh, yeah. media pretty, pretty closely um, European uh, football as well. And it doesn't seem like um, there's kind of been uh, the same level of outrage. Uh, I think there's definitely been some misgivings um, and some questions, but uh I get the impression um, a couple of things. One is that I think the Americans, um, I think we're happy to be here after, um, you know, having missed the, the uh, last one. And then also I think, um, I think the world cup and, you know, football, soccer, as we call it is getting bigger, but uh, you know, I don't think it still kind of dominates um, the kind of headlines and um, grabs all the attention like the way it does in England. So um so I think it's still kind of some way down the list. Like we recently had our congressional elections a couple of weeks ago. So there's kind of issues like that um, that have kind of been higher up the bill. Whereas I feel in England, um, even with you know various political things happening over there, it seems like uh, the World Cup and the Three Lions always uh, grab a lot of attention. Yeah. Well, you've nicely segued onto the football. So let's let's talk about the football because that's obviously what we're we're here to to chat about. We don't need to speak about American or English politics. <laughs> <laughs> we're here all day um but obviously america are in england's group you you went to the the america wales game is that right yeah i was there um that match was at 10 p.m local time and um uh, actually maybe that's another comment i could make about the logistics i i didn't get home until like uh three o'clock in the morning it oh, was uh wow. It's quite crowded. It was kind of difficult to get, to get out of the stadium, but yeah, overall though, it was a pretty enjoyable experience, match experience. I kind of thought it was a game of two halves, really. I, I thought you you done you you dominated the first half, and and then Wales sort of decided in the second half. They thought actually we're here at our first World Cup since whenever it was fifty eight. I think uh, we'd better make a uh, better make a fist of this. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I thought uh, America was, you know, the U.S. was playing more on the front foot um, in the first half. Seems like they were more aggressive, um, and they seems like they had prepared well and had a good game plan plan in place. I think um, there weren't that many uh, clear. They had to score the one goal, obviously, uh, and they had a couple clear cut chances, um, which maybe they should have taken advantage of. But you know, I don't. There's. Uh, there are no chances that kind of scream out at me uh, that you know they should have maybe put a, another goal. Uh, on the on the scoreboard but i thought they you know controlled the tempo pretty well controlled the ball pretty well and um i thought they were playing pretty well defensively uh as well and to be honest uh i was kind of surprised because uh the team um kind of kind of like england they didn't exactly have the best uh, build up uh to uh to the world cup back in september they lost to japan uh 2-0 and then they drew with saudi arabia and then also i was thinking that since um there's only one player on the squad um, who has ever played in a World Cup back in 2014. Uh, the rest of the players are not only are they the green in terms of uh, lacking World Cup experience, but they're also generally pretty young as well. So um, I was kind of surprised that there didn't seem to be any nerves or any sort of hesitation. They kind of um, were pretty aggressive from the get go. But, um, you know, I followed Wales a little bit as well, and uh, I've been impressed with their manager, uh, uh, Paige. So I thought um, he seemed to have uh, made some good adjustments at the half and, um, you know, maybe lit a fire under the players as well because they, they seemed to more, be more aggressive. Uh, they changed to Kiefer Moore up front um, uh, from Dan James, and I think they gave him more of a focal point, and uh, uh, they definitely got into the match in the second half. Yeah, no, it was the uh, it was unfortunate foul on Gareth Bale. Um, to give away the the penalty for the equaliser for for Wales there to to score, but yeah, Timothy Weir, um, who scored for the States, um, I have to be honest, hold my hands up, I wasn't aware of him, especially being being George Weir's son. Yeah, no, I mean, he's got a great uh, pedigree, and um, he's playing in uh, France these days in Lille, and um, I think he's definitely been one on the uh, kind of radar of the last few years in terms of uh, one of the many up and uh, up and coming talents. Uh, that we have. And he's also uh, relatively young. Um, so I think I actually did hear an interview with him um, the other day. And, uh, you know, he seemed uh, like a pretty uh, confident guy, but 
I think it must be difficult trying to live up to a uh, father's living in your father's shadow like that, you know, but it's nice to see him kind of get his breakout moment. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, scored a uh, scored a good goal. It's good, um, good slide through slide through ball. I think from from Pulisic that he uh, he ran yeah, onto. I thought, and... I thought they built it up uh, very well. Um, I was very impressed with uh, the build up to the goal and uh, kind of Pulisic actually played very well in the first half. Uh, I was very impressed. I thought I thought maybe him and some of the other players kind of also tired a little bit um, in the second half as well because you know Pulisic. Uh, he hasn't played that much for Chelsea. And then also even for the U S team, he's kind of been in and out, uh, in and out with injuries. So it seemed like he kind of ran out of steam a little bit in the second half. Remind me of the, what was the stadium that it was played at? Uh, so, uh, we were, we were at the Ahmed bin Ali stadium, which is about, uh, I think about maybe 20 kilometers West of the central Doha. Okay. And, and what was it like in there? Cause I mean, from the, the TV footage, I, I was watching it. It wasn't full, which has been a, a little issue that's been picked up on back here. That, that some of the uh, not all the tickets have been sold. But what, what was it like as a stadium? Yeah, I was actually surprised it wasn't full as well, especially when they announced. Um, I think uh, capacity attendance. Um, I thought it was it was a very nice stadium. Uh, it was uh, you could obviously tell it had been constructed per, to perfect to perfection. Mm. Uh, I thought the uh, entry uh, process was uh, pretty smooth. Um, you know, uh, there was uh, definitely plenty of room in the concourses. Uh, the views that I had, I was behind the uh, one of the goals, uh, very good views. It seemed like most of the views in the stadium, uh, no obstruction, had very good sight lines. Um, in terms of the atmosphere, um, it was pretty good. Uh, you know, I thought it was... Uh, Maybe a, a kind of up and down, a, a little flat uh, at times, but that might have been more to do with kind of the uh, the uh, the ebb and flow of the match. Um, I think um, I think once uh, kind of the Welsh team uh, started playing a little bit better, and then especially after they scored, um, you know, maybe towards extra time when they maybe had a couple other uh, pushing to get a maybe a winner. Um, I thought definitely. Uh, the uh, the atmosphere got it even a little bit better because I think it seemed um, it's always kind of hard to tell, uh, especially from my vantage point. But it seemed like um, we were definitely uh, outnumbered uh, by the by the Welsh fans. Um, uh, the other thing I kind of noticed was um, there seemed to be um, fans of there was a good number of U.S. fans. Um, I think we were making up one of the largest contingents um, at this World Cup, but there seemed to be a lot of fans from various other uh, nations as well. Um, it seems like the uh, Latin American countries have the strongest representation here mm. in Qatar. And I, I definitely noticed that on my flight over to the Middle East and then also on the flight over to Doha as well, uh, especially Mexican fans and then lots of Argentinian fans as well. So they seem to make up kind of a good, uh, lots of neutrals in there. And they kind of seem to be um, cheering um, kind of whichever wind the way the wind was blowing. <laughs> so I don't, <laughs> yeah, so I don't think they really had a strong um, horse uh, in the, in the race, but um but they also provided some nice atmosphere as well, I thought. I see. Well, next up is obviously England at the Albayat Stadium for the States. Is that a game you got a ticket for? No, I think that's a kind of another thing I regret. Um, I When I planned this trip, I was, you know, I planned it back in April and um, just the way they had to make, you had to jump through so many hoops, secure the accommodations, find the flights. So, um, I kind of my logistics uh, came out where I'm leaving on Friday, uh, Friday afternoon. So, gotcha. so I, I kind of planned this all before all the ticket phases uh, went into place. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to miss that one, unfortunately. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> based on obviously England's performance, I mean, be, being English myself, obviously I'm going to say it's going to be a, an England win, but how, how do you see that game going? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I would have to agree with you. Um, you know, just trying to be uh, as objective as possible. Uh, I think a few, a few reasons for that. One is um, not only was England very impressive in the first match, um, you know, I thought it's very hard to do that in a, in a first match, especially, you know, Iran was actually billed uh, by some as, uh, you know, being a potential dark horse and they have had some very solid results uh, lately. So that not only was a performance impressive, but I've always had the feeling that um, despite their recent struggles, um, you know, you can't deny the talent uh, that's on the uh, the roster. And then I think also um, it's still like, I don't know the exact age. I think it's still a relatively young team, but they do have um, 
some good winning experience uh, from the last uh, four years, um, you know, even though they've come up short. But um, I think that experience and the ta- experience, the talent, um, the experience both in the players and the management, um, I think, you know, kind of proves to be uh, invaluable and in, uh, in tournaments like this. So I've always thought um, they're going to do very well. I think I actually predicted that they would make it to the finals. Um, I, I think I predicted Brazil to win, but you know how those are. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely give England the edge um, in terms of from the American perspective. Um, you know, like I had mentioned, um, not much experience, just one player who's played in the World Cup. Uh, I think it's a second youngest squad um, that that uh, here at the tournament. Um, and then, you know, I think I think people don't like talking about this, but it does kind of you do kind of get the impression and feeling that it's kind of um, more of like. Um, I don't want to put this the wrong way, but more of like, uh, you know, kind of happy to be there and then more kind of building up towards um, what's going to happen in uh, 2026 uh, since uh, we'll be hosting it along with uh, Canada and Mexico. So it's kind of more to gain experience. Um, That being said, um, you know, there are a lot of talented players uh, on this American team. Um, You know, I've been following uh, for uh, several decades now and uh, you definitely can, uh, tell like um with these players there's can't seems to be a step up um uh kind of in the individual quality uh you can kind of see it in you know some of the places that they play i think um i, I think uh, you know a lot of english uh, people would would be very familiar with a lot of the players because uh you know there's players who play for chelsea leeds uh fulham so um so there is there there is a lot of quality Although I guess I guess maybe another criticism I have of the uh, U.S. team is that it seems like in years past uh, we weren't as talented. Uh, we definitely didn't have players playing in top leagues in England and Europe uh, like we do now. You know, we also have players in Juventus at uh, AC Milan, but it seems like the teams of old uh, they were kind of um, more solid. They had a chip on their shoulder, and they seemed to like kind of play. Uh, uh, more as a team, whereas with this one, I get the impression that there's a lot of individual talent. Um, that's undeniable, but it seems like they're having a hard time kind of putting it together um, as a team. And we've seen that not only against Wales, but even the qualifying. It it was a uh, it wasn't um, a major question mark whether they'd qualify, but it, there was a lot of up and down performances. Just had a hard time kind of stringing some consistency together. Yeah, oh, I uh, I understand what you're saying about obviously looking towards the next World Cup, but perhaps feeling it's it's not really the right thing to say because obviously you're in the here and the now. But right. yeah, I, I certainly understand how what well, sort of that perspective you're coming from. But with this being the the third meeting between England and the States at a World Cup, obviously you you won the 1951, we drew the 2010 <laughs> one. It's it's only our time this time, surely. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, go on. Tell us before before we let you go. What what are your plans for the rest of the or whilst your time in um, in Qatar? What what tickets have you got to uh, to games? Where are you going? So yeah, I wanted to thank you for accommodating me. I know it's very early for you t- this morning. Um, so today I'm going to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia versus Argentina, mm-hmm. and then uh, and then I'll be following that up with uh, Croatia versus. I'm oh, sorry, uh, uh, Denmark versus Tunisia, and then I, and then I also have. Uh, uh, Morocco versus uh, Croatia, and then on, I think on Thursday I'll see uh, Switzerland versus Ghana, and then Portugal, uh, Switzerland, Switzerland versus Cameroon, and then Portugal versus Ghana. Uh, so it's it's quite packed. Um, you know, I think I wasn't originally planning on seeing this many packing this many matches in, but kind of various friends got various different different tickets in the draw. But it seems like it be it might be a little bit too much to to, sque- <laughs> to squeeze this much into uh, four days. No, nah, do it, do it, get as much in as you can. And then obviously the going on to, uh, to India, you can have a little break. Right. Right. Uh, I should be, uh, back in the, uh, back in Dubai for the, uh, England versus, uh, USA match. Uh, so hopefully I'll get to catch that. And, um, you know, like they, like there's old saying here in the U S like, um, you know, you got to play the game so you can't go by uh, what's on paper. So hopefully, uh, the U S team can, um, you know, uh, play play England tight and uh, maybe come up with a surprise result. But um, yeah, I definitely, uh, I, I definitely see that's going to be hard to do, though. Well, we shall see. Garav, as always, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate you giving us some of your time. And yeah, I mean, we've spoken before, and, and I'd like to think we'll uh, we'll speak again. 
Yeah, anytime. Uh, I, re- I really enjoy your podcast, Russell. Um, I think you do a, a great job. Uh, guests are um, always excellent uh, every week. Uh, so I'm happy to, my pleasure to speak to you. Oh, well, it's, it's much appreciated and, and it wouldn't be what it is without the guests. Many thanks to both Aidan and to Gura for their time. Really appreciated, especially uh, with the quick turnaround needed for these podcasts. Uh, I'll link to both of them on the Three Lions podcast Twitter account should you want to go and give them a follow. One thing I should have mentioned earlier, but I think it's a nice thing to end on. Whilst many England fans have probably seen this story, I think it's, it's worth mentioning again and also for the international listeners that tune in. You may have noticed when Jack Grealish scored his goal in England's sixth against Iran, he'd done a little outstretched waving arms celebration. Now this was especially for a young Manchester City fan he'd met a little while back, Finlay. Now Finlay has cerebral palsy and when they met, Finlay asked him to do a celebration when Jack scored. And Jack did. He did score. And he remembered. And this is what he had to say about it. Obviously I met uh, young Finley before. Um, about a month ago. Um, and yeah. Got on obviously really well with him. Um, him obviously. You know having cerebral palsy. Like my little sister as well. So um, you know he asked me to do a celebration for him. And luckily for him you know it came at the World Cup. I mean, loads to him, won't it? Seeing, seeing you do that on the biggest yeah, stage. Yeah, of course. That's that's what it's all about, you know. For me, it's just obviously doing a celebration. Um, but for for him, you know, that will mean the world to him, I'm sure. Um, especially me doing it at the World Cup. So, Finley, that one's for you. Love that. Real feel-good story, that one. Well done, Jack. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. Now, normally... I'd be doing a USA review and a Wales preview episode. But my own personal circumstances mean that I'm not going to be able to do this. It's frustrating as I am away as of the USA game and I'm only returning late Sunday. And with the Wales game being played on Tuesday, I simply don't have the time to turn something around. I'm sorry but you get what you pay for. (laughs) However, all things going to plan, hopefully I'll be back with you to review that Wales game and look ahead to whoever we've been drawn against in the round of 16. So I very much hope that you can join me for that. So until then, please take care of yourselves. Continue to enjoy the tournament. If you're returning home after a few games, or heading out for the knockouts. Safe journey. Cheers. <laughs>